Okay, so up next, we've got Alice Bose Larkin of the Tyndall Center, University of Manchester. Okay, so we're going to take a little bit of a different tack now because rather than focusing on the extreme weather, um, my research focuses more on what we need to do about climate change and how we can avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And I've given the talk a title, just says, you know, why is two degrees such an important number, the case for radical mitigation? And two degrees, as I'll explain, is the temperature warming above pre-industrial levels that we're aiming to avoid. And I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail and hopefully make a case for why we need to radically change um, what we're doing at the moment in order to actually do something to avoid the worst effects of climate change. So first of all, I want to talk about influencing the future. Because if we think about climate change and what to do about it, I think often it can feel very disempowering and, and a too big a problem to actually deal with. Um, but one of the things that we've just seen is that we've already had an influence on our climate. And, and whilst that's very depressing in some ways, it can also be quite empowering because we know that we can have an influence on our future as well. So the decisions that we make now in relation to the energy that we use, deforestation and so on, is it going to make a, an impact, it's going to have an impact on the amount of future climate change that we're going to have to experience, and not just us, obviously people all the way around the world will have to experience and deal with and make decisions around, as we've just been hearing. So mitigation here means like uh, reducing CO2 emissions effectively, so if we mitigate a lot, if we cut our emissions a lot, then we will have to do less adaptation to climate change. I mean, that's quite a logical position. On the other hand, we could also reduce our emissions less, so we could do less about the problem to do with climate change, um, which means that we will have to do more adaptation to the climate change impacts um, in terms of the extreme weather events and so on. So we do have a choice going forward. We can influence the amount of climate change that we're going to experience. What we do know also is that there isn't a no climate change future. And that's not just from the physical sciences point of view, this type of stuff that we've set in train. It's also because we know that we can't change our energy systems overnight. We have fossil fuel based energy systems and we can't just switch them off. So there isn't a no climate change future, but what we can do is influence the amount of climate change that we're going to have to experience and deal with. So there's a global ambition in order to deal with climate change that some of you may be familiar with. And that's that we're committed to making a fair contribution to hold the, the increase in global temperatures to below a two degree Celsius, and that's above pre-industrial levels, and to take action to meet this objective consistent with the science and on the basis of equity. And this issue of equity is hugely important in the climate negotiations and hugely important in terms of who has to do what about reducing emissions. And this is written up in what's called the Copenhagen Accord, which was back in 2009. So two degrees is taken as the threshold between what we call acceptable and dangerous climate change. There is science behind the two degree target, but it's also subjective and on the basis of the different impacts around the world and what we consider to be dangerous. What are the kind of impacts that you might experience at two degrees? Well, some of the things, just to very briefly capture, because we've heard a lot already about some of the extreme weather events, but the widespread mortality of corals, increased risks of extreme weather events, increased water stress, wildfire frequency, hundreds of millions of people suffering coastal flooding. So two degrees is dangerous, but what about four degrees? In, in climate policy, we hear an awful lot about two degrees. But one of the problems is that we don't think we're really on track to avoid it at the moment. And I'll show and demonstrate why that's the case. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about carbon budgets. And that's the amount of CO2 we can put into our atmosphere for different amounts of climate change. So if we aimed for a higher temperature, perhaps with some more extreme weather events, are there things that we could deal with? Does that allow us a bigger amount of CO2 emissions and therefore a bit more flexibility in how we deal with climate change? This, just to show you, is a, actually it's a Google add-on to Google Earth and that was developed by the Hadley Center and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And I'm just highlighting it because I think it's a really nice way of communicating some of the impacts of what four degrees means. Because two degrees, four degrees, they don't sound like very big numbers. 
But remember, these are global average temperature changes. Most of our planet is sea, and therefore the changes in the temperature are actually more amplified over the land than they are over the sea. And a, and a sort of a, a tool such as this gives you the sense of the kind of temperature changes and other sorts of changes, extreme weather events that might happen in a four degree future, not a two degree future. And just one example I've picked out just for now is things like hottest days. So when we talk about four degrees, it doesn't sound too much warmer. We could deal with that quite nice in Manchester where I, I live. But actually, that's not what we're talking about. So if you imagine the hottest day that you experience in a city in Northern Europe, then you're looking at around eight degrees warmer on top of that. If you're looking in Southeast Asia, it might be six degrees warmer. New York and Chicago, something like 10 or 12 degrees warmer. Now, these are estimates, and there's lots of uncertainty. But if you think about how hot a hottest day is and what that, you know, how, how unpleasant that could be, and then imagine it this much warmer, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about when we talk about four degrees. Within the scientific literature, there's a widespread consensus that four degrees is incompatible with organized global community, beyond adaptation, devastating to ecosystems, and highly unlikely to be stable. So there's a potential that we could tip into a new equilibrium in terms of climate change. So very, very worrying, and consequently, there's lots of policymakers and lots of scientists who are saying that four degrees should be avoided at all costs. Okay, so back to two degrees. How are we doing so far? This is a graph of CO2 emissions, which is the main anthropogenic, the main human-induced greenhouse gas. We've got time from 1750, pre-industrial revolution, out to 2013. Carbon dioxide emissions per year up the left-hand side. And hopefully you can all get the picture. Our emissions are growing exponentially. This is despite the fact that we've been talking and negotiating around climate change for a very long time. This little blip here is the global economic downturn because our CO2 emissions are very closely linked to economic growth. So, where are the current policies leading at the moment? We're on this track of lower mitigation, higher adaptation. That's the track we're on at the moment. That's how much we're influencing our future. So, the current policies are more in line with four, maybe even six degrees of warming by 2100. And quite a lot of people has, are saying this now and are very concerned about the trends and the trajectories that we're on, including quite a conservative organization, the International Energy Agency. And their chief economist is talking about four to six degrees of warming by 2100. And that is extremely worrying. Now, because we've had a severe delay in avoiding this two degree of warming, the question is now, how can we possibly now meet the target? Is there any hope? Is this problem just far too big? What I want to do is I just want to explain one quick concept to you, and that's the concept of cumulative emissions. It's actually not how much we do a long time in the future in terms of reducing emissions that really matters. It's what we do in the meantime, because it's not where we get to. So if the, you imagine this is some level of CO2 emissions up the left-hand side, time from the year 2000 out to 2050. It's not where we get to in 2050 that really matters. It's the area under this curve that delivers the climate outcome. Okay, so imagine that this is the trajectory we wanted to follow to avoid a two degree target. The amount of emissions that we've already released are captured by this area under the curve here up to say 2013, 2014. So we, have, we will have some climate impact because of those emissions. If we then want to follow this trajectory to avoid two degrees, then we need to put the policies in place to do that. If we then find that what we do is we start to move off our trajectory, um, and this has actually happened in the UK where we've actually used more coal in the last uh, year or so, and so our CO2 emissions, they were starting to decline and they've started to go up again. If we overshoot this, because it's the area under the curve that matters, whatever we overshoot it by has to be compensated for later. And there's a couple of consequences of that that are important when we're thinking about energy and how to deal with climate change. One is that if we had a target for 2050, which we've set ourselves and seems like a long time away and we can mull over what to do about it, actually that target is not fixed because it depends how well we do in the meantime as to whether or not we're going to achieve our goal, which might be avoiding two degrees of warming. Also, the trajectory becomes steeper. So if we thought we could put a few policies in place to try to what we call decarbonize our energy system, um, we would actually have to do that much more quickly if we don't do enough in the short term. So it's all about trying to get this point across that the short term really matters. 
And that tells us a couple of quite useful things. So if we now just apply this to the global uh, CO2 emissions, so again, CO2 emissions from fossil fuel and cement use at the left-hand side. Now we've got from 1980 out to 2050 on the bottom. And the pink line here is the recent emissions. And again, here's our nice economic downturn here. If emissions continue to follow a sort of high emission trajectory, so if we continue the way we're going at the moment, and there's quite a lot of different scenarios out there, but I've just picked one off just to, to illustrate this, then our, our outcome is determined by the area under this curve. And this is something like a four to, four to six degrees of warming. If, on the other hand, we want a reasonably good chance of avoiding two degrees, and this probability stuff, that also makes it a bit more complicated. It means that there's more uncertainty in our carbon budget. But if we want a pretty good chance, let's say 66% chance of avoiding two degrees, then we need to be following something more like this red trajectory. And again, there's a couple of things that we can look at if we think about this importance of cumulative emissions. First of all, we need to do something very rapidly different from what we're doing at the moment. Now, I could switch off the lights, if I knew where the button was, and I could switch off the electricity in this room right now. That's the demand side. I could do some things very quickly because of my behavior. But there are other things that need to change that I can't do quickly. I can't change the UK's energy system overnight. I can't replace uh, coal fire power stations with the appropriate technology, even if it's renewables, wind farms, also nuclear power stations, any of the technologies that we might think of as clean, and there's obviously debate around what they should be. We can't change that overnight. It's going to take decades. So we need to be focusing on what you can do in the short to medium term. It won't all be on the demand side, but certainly the focus at the moment should be what we can do in terms of energy demand. Later on, and, and now as well, we need to be putting in place the infrastructure to decarbonize our energy supply. But that's only going to bring our emissions down in the next 20 or 30 years, say. It's not going to do enough in the short to medium term. So we urgently require different policies to get us off this track that's aiming for four to six degrees. And we also need to think about different parts of the world and how they might respond to this challenge. Because actually, we're all facing different challenges depending on, or, or different um, issues depending on the wealth of different countries and the kind of energy systems that we're already locked into. But one way of looking at this, this was based on a paper we had a couple of years ago, is that actually if you split out the richer countries and the poorer countries, then the kinds of emission reductions, if we consider this word equity, if we try to look at the fairness of some countries developing um, in, in terms of proving their standards of living in the same ways that we have, then we're looking at emission reductions of nearer to 10% per year um, every year in order to have a good chance of avoiding two degrees. What are the precedents for such reductions? Well, there was a report by Nicholas Stern back in 2006. Annual reductions of greater than 1% per year have only ever been associated with economic recession or upheaval. The UK made a big switch to gas back in the uh, 80s and 90s, and the French increased their nuclear capacity by 40 times. And even those big shifts only had 1% per year reduction in emissions. The collapse of the Soviet Union economy had emission reductions of 5% per year. That's probably the most extreme example that's out there. Now, this is not to say that we should be collapsing our economies in order to deal with climate change, but what it does point us to is that we have a big problem when we want to grow our economies, and our economies are built on us consuming stuff, and if we want to continue to do that and cut emissions in line with two degrees, then that means that we've got some very difficult choices in front of us. So how feasible is change? Well, there are different points of view, as you can imagine. Um, our own Committee on Climate Change in the UK has said to keep global average temperature rise close to two degrees, the UK must cut emissions by at least 80% by 2050, they're talking about. And the good news is that reductions of that size are possible without sacrificing the benefits of economic growth and rising prosperity. So nice, upbeat message from the Committee on Climate Change. Um, we would take an alternative view, and, uh, and this might be controversial, but if we consider it appropriate for poorer nations to actually have enough emission budget, so they need some of this budget too, to develop and improve their welfare, then for the wealthier nations, dangerous climate change can only be avoided if economic growth is exchanged, at least temporarily, for a period of planned austerity within Annex One nations. Now, as you can imagine, this isn't a very popular statement. But this is something that's coming out of the science when you look at the scale of reductions that are necessary to avoid two degrees. 
So is it feasible to actually avoid two degrees in this way? Well, I'd like to put out three messages of hope, if you like, in relation to that, that, uh, that, that challenge of two degrees. One is about equity. Another is about technology and how we can do quite a lot with technology. And another is about growth um, and how perhaps it's a useful proxy, but maybe it's also an obstructive dogma. So equity. There's little chance that we're going to make policies that are going to work for 7 billion people on the planet. Maybe, you know, many more people in future as well. However, how many of us actually need to reduce our emissions? About 40 to 60% of emissions are actually from about 1 to 5% of the global world's population. Who are they? <laughs> That's us. OECD, other academics, climate scientists, anyone who gets on a plane once a year, politicians, decision makers. We're the people that have got high per capita emissions, so we're the people that are going to have to reduce those emissions in order that there is some element of equity within this debate. Technology, if we think about technology and we think about the demand side rather than the supply side, there's actually great gains to be made, and we don't push this very hard at all. There's lots of different sectors that could do an awful lot more on the demand side. Take refrigeration, it could be light. We need electricity, that electricity has to come down power lines from a power station, and we need to extract fuel. All of those things take energy and losses in the system. So if, say, we wanted 10 units of light, that has a conversion, perhaps we lose something like 80% of that in the actual conversion from electricity into our useful service, our useful light. We'll lose another 8 to 10% or so down the power lines, and our power stations are probably about 35, 40% efficient. So we lose a huge amount of our fossil fuel energy in the conversion to electricity, and we have to get it out of the ground. So in order to get our 10 units of useful energy at one end, we're putting in 133 at the other. So if we could do something on the demand side, like switch off that light, or the fridge turns on and off at different times because we get much more clever with our electricity grid, then maybe we can save some big amounts of energy and therefore CO2 emissions in future. So the demand opportunities dwarf those from the supply side in the short to medium term. Finally, on growth, just before I finish, growth is a proxy for many things that we want in life. We want good health, good life expectancy, employment, income, equity, literacy rates. We want good crime and safety or low crime and good safety. Um, and we want time with our family and friends. We want nice things to make our lives good. Um, but the problem is that we focus very much on economic growth, which is so closely linked to our CO2 emissions and essentially driven by our consumption patterns that this makes the challenge much more difficult in order to avoid two degrees. So to summarize, first of all, don't shoot the messenger. This is just the implications for policy from looking at the numbers and trying to work out how we can avoid the worst effects of climate change. So we first of all should avoid four degrees at all costs and get ourselves off this track of, of lower mitigation, higher adaptation. Wealthy nations like the UK probably needs to cut its emissions by around 60% over the next decade or so, so in the very short to medium term. Low carbon energy supply is not going to be able to deliver the emission reductions fast enough, um, so we need to look at the demand side. We need to reduce it now, both through behavioural change and also through technology. Only a small percent of the global po population actually needs to hear this message in terms of radical mitigation. Most people are not high emitters, but we are. So we need to think differently about how we use energy and our energy systems in general. But we also need to raise this debate about different measures of well-being because it really is a big problem from the climate change point of view that our big focus on economic growth, and we get this in our own grant applications, so we have to show how our research is going to contribute to economic growth. And if you do this sort of analysis and you see the numbers and it tells you that actually economic growth is a bit of a problem, then it actually makes writing your grant proposal quite difficult as well. So. <laughs> Ultimately, uh, we need to escape the shackles of 20th century mindset if we're ever going to resolve the 21st century challenges. And this is going to demand leadership, courage, innovative thinking, engaged teams, but also difficult choices. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Alice, and uh, thanks to all our speakers.